Spider-Man, my ultimate review! No web slinging. Shit. So here's how I'm going to play this out. With Spider-Man Homecoming coming out in July, the five movies before it haven't been reviewed on my channel, so I figured why not give this a shot and review all the theatrically released Spider-Man films with Tobey Maguire leading to Andrew Garfield. Starting with Tobey's trilogy, I figured I'd cover all three films in one video. Meaning, if you want to go and see what I thought about three, you can skip ahead to whatever time. Yeah, that, that time. And see what I think there. Let's get into Spider-Man back in 2002. Talk about a blast from the past. My nostalgia senses were tingling for sure. Ooh, that was a little creepy. I'm... Uh, I'm not gonna do that again. <laughs> all in all, this movie came to theaters and I barely remember my experience in it. I watched it and I thought, well, it wasn't bad. For sure. But I don't know what was up with them. Truth be told, Spider-Man 1 is a gorgeous movie to look at. It's excellently told to my opinion, and honestly, I think in its first act it has everything going for it. We're introduced to Peter, played by Tobey Maguire, of course, and he's the nerdy kid on the block, opposed to the girl next door, Mary Jane Watson, played by Kristen Dunst. Overall, I really felt like Peter's characterization is pretty spot on. He's likable, and Toby really gives a decent performance, if not slightly subtle, and not completely over the top. Emotional, too. But it's the supporting characters that really make who Peter is. Peter lives with his Aunt May and Uncle Ben, and they are probably the strongest force in his life, helping him along in the stages that are now this crucial turning point in his life. Harry Osborn is another character that is actually Peter's best friend, played by James Franco. I like to think that Harry is the middleman in this movie. He supports Peter and is his friend, when no one else really is. Of course, also causes conflict, especially when Harry ends up dating Mary Jane in the middle of this movie. But Harry, in a way, definitely keeps Peter grounded in a lot of aspects. Because during that field trip, he gets bitten by a radioactive spider, and it starts giving him more than he thought he would get, when it just should have been just sickness and death. How you doing? Hi. Oh, would you like a bite to eat? No thanks. Had a bite. Well then. And this is where I give all of my praise in the beginning. All of the characters are established within the first act, and 30 minutes in, we definitely have an understanding to Peter's powers. It's a great treatment for an origin story, along with Norman Osborn, played by William Defoe. What? who definitely takes the spotlight every time he's on screen. They find a great balance making sure he isn't too over the top and doesn't outshine Peter's character either. Most of all, I love the dialogue between most of these characters. It's either passionate between Mary Jane or Peter. You know, you're taller than you look, my hunch. Don't. Or it's full of great one-liners, focused dialogue that doesn't require overselling or over-explaining. So when we're talking about turning points, when just not only is the radioactive spider the biggest turning point for Peter, but when Uncle Ben gets shot, that's even worse. And you realize that this is gonna be a really different ride for Peter than the way he imagined just growing up naturally. It's not forced any more than it's warranted, and it's sad, and it really means something. So I said things were done really well for the first act. It's the second act where I feel like a lot of people may not see what I see or feel the same way. It gets a bit choppy. Like, for the second act, it really shows the passage of time in some very memorable, if not corny ways. Which is great, don't get me wrong, but some of the jumps, they become polarizing and awkward. And it's like, <laughs> immediately, Peter's graduation. And I'm like, what? What? I mean, I wasn't aware of the year Mary and Peter and Flash were all in together, so it doesn't suddenly become apparent until right now. Was he a freshman? Was he a sophomore? Or was he a senior just waiting to graduate? What was it? I don't know. I don't know. 
overall, I just had issues with the pacing in the second act, which ultimately show the full form of the Spider-Man outfit, which is an all-suspended believability. Aside from a broke, nerdy teenager, the suit looks spectacular. Look at it. Look at it. It's awesome. I couldn't make that. Couldn't even try. I'm not artistic like that. You could definitely tell people are having fun in their roles, especially William Defoe. Hell, he, even the side characters, the ones that, that briefly cause conflict for Spider-Man and come onto the screen. Let's talk about that iconic scene that everybody knows. Everybody. Mary Jane kissing Spider-Man upside down. Who was watching the fight scene? Who? You were looking at that excellent choreography, the perfect shots of every blow landing in the thugs' faces. Who was paying attention to that? Who? You were busy pausing on Mary Jane, weren't you? Come on, you want to admit it. Admit it. Admit it! It's okay. I was too. Imagine if nobody was admitting to that right in that moment. I just confessed for no reason. That's of course unless you're, you're a girl and you'd have no reason to pause there. That would be awkward too. Unless that's your thing. No judgment here. I promise. You're safe here. Overall, I had a blast re-watching this film after I don't know how many years. And my feelings on the film actually haven't changed that much to which I only liked the film then and I still like it now. Now, it's not completely unbalanced. I mean, I, that's, I'm being a little, if that's me being nitpicky and, and, and critical, there's that. But the corniness actually kind of segues enough to help you kind of transition into the passage of time, all that other stuff. So the, the corniness is sprinkled within this movie. And those moments are either cringeworthy to humorous to bust a gut laughing. This all goes very well in the end. And I felt like I was only missing a little bit of Peter's progression into the famous web slinger. Other than that, a lot of stuff works in this. The relationships work, the action works, the humor. Oh my god, the humor is great. I've got one letter, two names, and that is J. Jonah Jameson. Laughed every time, enough said. J.K. Simmons, you are comedic gold. <laughs> In the end, I strongly like Spider-Man 1, and with some slight reservations over the pacing issues, like I said, slightly awkward act between the second and third. The third sends it all home, focuses up, and gives us the what-if parts of the sequel, like what if Mary Jane had an idea that if Peter Parker may be Spider-Man? It's that slight, subtle hint that she may know, but it's only finding out, and it's just the theory, like... I'm going to give Spider-Man Like It, which is a very strong like, and of course, I own it on DVD. So those are my thoughts on Spider-Man 1. Without further ado, let's get into Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man 2 is directed by Sam Raimi, and it's pretty much the same cast as well as it was the same director from the first one. So you're going to get a lot more of the same thing from Spider-Man 1. And that is very much a good thing. And this takes place probably about two years after the events of the first movie, but Peter's trying to make a living in the city while balancing his life as the masked web crawler. He's pretty much been estranged from everyone. Where you been, pal? You don't return my calls. I've been kind of busy. Mary, Harry, and Aunt May. Hell, even his jobs get the short end of the stick. Where you been? Looking for you all morning. You're late. All the way is late. You're fired. He's too busy being a superhero. Being a superhero sucks. Don't be one. No, I'm just kidding. You can be one. I, I want to be one. Just saying. So, let's catch up on whoever else I haven't covered yet. Um, we have Harry, who's taken over his father's business at Oscorp and trusts this new direction of the company in Dr. Octavius, who promises a new wave in fusion power. And that actually has a very interesting key, pivotal point in the story, which I have to say, Harry doesn't necessarily get a bad treatment here. But he sort of takes the back seat in the story so much as that he becomes just the butt end of all the jokes, all the moments, every situation. He gets hit hard with most of the things. So you know when Dr. Octavius does his thing and things go wrong, it's Harry that takes the fall. And when Harry takes the fall, he lashes out. But he uses these moments to his advantage as well later on in the movie. Bring Spider-Man to me. How do I find him? 
Peter Parker. Mary Jane is living her dream as an actress while getting married to J. Jonah Jameson's son. So that adds a nice interesting twist in the whole scheme of things, especially since Peter is like, I still love you, Mary Jane. And she's like, I know you love me, but you just don't make time for me. So guess what? I'm not waiting for you. I'm going over here. Okay? Okay. I'm sorry you missed out, kiddo. And even Aunt May has her own issues, as she may not be able to keep the house everyone's lived in for decades. Altogether, everything has pretty much been constructed as it needs to for everyone's lives to realistically progress in this movie. And that's saying a lot. Usually they could do something completely off the wall and say, oh, well, we could have Harry Osborn become super strong and get after Spider-Man so he'll be on a rampage and use Peter and no, they actually stay grounded. They make sure Harry has a realistic progression more than say a comic bookish progression, so to speak. As things develop, we watch every choice Peter makes become almost his downfall as it affects himself and others. The more Peter resists into Harry's taunts about Peter knowing who Spider-Man is, the more tense things become. If there's anything that I love watching about this film is that Peter is nearly reminded every second how close yet so far away he is. There are several several scenes where an entree or an object that Peter wants comes into the frame and he goes to take it but another hand reaches out of the frame into and then just takes it and then he's just left there going you almost feel desperate with him and then when Peter has these moments to reflect when he finally does kind of feel like he's at the end of his rope you feel it with him he doesn't break down crying he doesn't get over dramatic or melodramatic or anything like that he has these moments of self-reflection and they're just so grounded and i love it because it's a struggle of living a life that you know you need to live and then not being able to do it because something else is preventing it it's fascinating and i love how they treated it in this movie. Spider-Man 2 is a huge improvement over its predecessor, and I pretty much loved every second of this film. The pacing is better. The first and second act flows together flawlessly as it balances the story of Peter's struggles to his sudden loss of powers, which is incorporated throughout extremely well. And that is actually one thing I forgot to mention. He does lose his powers briefly throughout fight scenes and moments of just swinging through the city. And it comes up almost out of nowhere and really unexpectedly for him because he's just kind of struggling with everything and he's not dealing with it in the way he should. So the powers on him are like, well, we're going to react to your stress even though you're not. No more web slinging! And he just goes, <laughs> sucks to be him. Now, of course, the third act of this is very noticeable. It's very overbearingly noticeable that this is, hey, you know, we know we're having some fun, but we also have to have, like, the end of the world doomsday device, and Dr. Octavius is kind of going off his nutter, and he's going to just, you know, redo a project that he's not supposed to do, but he's going to do it because, screw it, science. Well, you know, I mean, it's a good motivation. Don't get me wrong. I think if you did it once, but there was just one problem that wasn't actually part of your own calculations, or maybe it was, I can't, I can't really attest to that. But I can tell you that if it failed once, but you know it was working, you feel the need to do it again. Why not? I kind of get it, but at the same time, it's like, no, you're still bad because you're going to kill thousands and thousands of people in New York City. So you're a bad guy, Dr. Octavius. Spider-Man, stop him. So let's let's talk about Dr. Octavius, since I just now mentioned him and I mentioned him earlier. Alfred Molina. Wonderful. Just absolutely wonderful. I love when they introduce his character for the first time and Peter and the Doctor meet. It suddenly becomes apparent that this isn't the same spiel most movies are trying to convey. Doc Oct doesn't start off bad. In fact, he starts off actually a little stern and dismissive to Peter when he first meets him. Then the layers are peeled back a little bit, and it's actually revealing a smart, charming man that's actually quite the love, love puppy with his wife. You know, it's just, he's very grounded. 
and you end up liking the guy who will be bad eventually. And I just found that to be brilliant. His decline isn't hammy, so to speak, but it almost becomes like a horror movie at one point because when things go terribly wrong, he ends up in a hospital and it just, it certainly just plays out like a horror slasher. Like the scene in the doctor's office when they're trying to saw off his, his, you know, the arms and everything like that. It's a fine example to watch a villain being born. The fight sequences are a lot of fun considering you don't know how long they're going to last until they keep going. There's like a, a bank sequence that I thought was actually going to be kind of like a one done wham bam thank you ma'am. And then it turned into the sequence that turned out to be one of my favorite fight scenes. Especially this scene. I'm coming! Ah! Hang on! From the music, to the action, to the moment Spider-Man is pulled away, just makes it that much more desperate for Peter to save Aunt May. I loved it. I'm gonna get the obvious out of the way and say I loved Spider-Man 2 and I own this on DVD and if I ever could get it on Blu-ray as well, I would do just that. In the end, all the things in this movie worked, absolutely worked. I felt like the characters, big and small, the writing is tight and focused, where Peter is losing his powers, holds a fine place within the story and comes up unexpected and is handled quite well. All in all, this is a strong addition in the franchise, and I know for a fact 1 and 2 are well-loved between critics and fans. I'm a part of that consensus, for crying out loud. Well, for the second one, more or less. I mean, like, the first one's great, but... Anyway, let's see how they follow up this victory with Spider-Man 3. They couldn't possibly screw this up. Right? Spider-Man 3, and I bet you any amount of money... You guys clicked on that link below and saw that this was the Spider-Man 3. You moved ahead and you came here, didn't you? Shame on you. Go back. Look at the other stuff. Go. It's not boring, I promise. Well, at least I hope it's not boring. Anyway, let's get back into this. I don't know how to explain Spider-Man 3. I don't. Um... When this movie came out, I recall telling a few of my friends that this movie, surprisingly, has a lot to juggle. It took a lot of ambition and started to throw in these storylines. And I don't know. I mean, of course, you could always boil that down to studios interfering or maybe Rami's vision was just too big for its own good. And you've heard the stories where, you know... You didn't find Venom a very compelling character. You thought he was soulless or something like that. Then they say, hey, you're going to put all this in here. Why don't we make this two parts? And ultimately, this is what we got. And whether you want to you know, point the blame at whoever, this is one messy movie. And I'm going to do the very best that I can to explain. You have Peter Parker, who's living on a high after the successes of winning Mary Jane, and he wants to propose to her. And... That's nice, of course. People love Spider-Man, and that's pretty much it when it comes to Peter Parker. This movie really makes Peter completely oblivious, and it's as if he wants to be, not so much as he's been conditioned that way. Mary Jane's acting gig takes a dip, but it really becomes all about her and how she refuses to tell Peter, making Peter even more oblivious. While I don't agree, with her keeping quiet and telling Peter what's going on with her, because I know all it would have taken was her to say something, and Peter would have went, Oh. Well, okay then. <laughs> she pretty much just... She's not only the grounded character in this, with any kind of real struggle. However, she went through acting gigs before. She did. She, she went through them before, and I only wish that they showed her trying to overcome this rather than just stew in her self-doubt. And let's get the biggest conflict out of the way. Harry goes after Peter for revenge, only for it to backfire, and it causes Harry to lose his memory, which I found poor excuse for this conflict. And of course, let's not forget about the symbiote. Uh, yeah, that, that thing's in this movie. Um... Just kind of lurks about in Peter's room and doesn't do anything until it's finally convenient. <sighs> so, <laughs> Flint, oh god, I forgot. 
Flint Marco is in this as well, and he turn, lazily turns into Sandman after falling into a pit and causes a ruckus around the city, later to be the reason of Uncle Ben's death, giving Peter more drive to be sad and angry and upset. And that especially becomes a convenient when the symbiote detaches to him. This part doesn't even come in, it's an hour of the film, but you know, hey. By the way, this is a thing now, just so you guys know, it was a moment in between moments for Uncle Ben's death, there was like, oh, there's that one more guy that actually did something, and he's really the culprit, and connectivity, yay! Okay, so I, I, I hashed through this, I kept forgetting that there was one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. There's a lot of story elements in this, a lot. And it will spend more time with Peter, I mean, rightfully so, but they would spend more time with him reminding us what he's been through in the last movie or so, and how everything's great, but when it comes to Harry Osborn, nope, he's full doped up on performance enhancers. He just, hey, ah, there we go. This is all gonna pay off, right? You could say that Harry had a while to build up to this moment, but they built his character very well in the last two movies, so without too much left to interpretation, here there's just no flow. Eight minutes in, actually, he is kind of ready for action. Kind of feels forced to me. Speaking of forced, they introduced three villains right away. I mean, I just explained all of that. The symbiote, Flint Marco, and Harry Osborn. It's in that moment I realized, and I'm sure you realized, that this movie's going to have a lot going on at once. Flow or not, they all establish this literally in 15 minutes. And it is truly, truly forced. I mean, the movie doesn't flow at all. It's one scene after another with no idea of the lapse of time. Ideas and concepts that get the fanboys and girls raging from it's in the comics or you have to understand. Whatever. It, it wasn't a big thing until like this Spider-Man 3 really started getting deeper into the lore when the symbiote shows up. It's all justifiable for some. I just wanted a good movie. This isn't a good movie. It's misguided. If there's anything really wrong with this film is that the fact is, and I hate to say this, everyone took a big bowl of stupid. They ate it and they thought it tasted good. Everyone talks to everyone like they're 12 years old. They remind one another half the time what they've been up to and what they are like to one another, almost beating you over the head. Hey, Harry, your father died. You have amnesia! You're completely oblivious! Oh, Peter, look at you! You're in a happy place. I hope nothing bad happens to you. You look like you're having a great time. Let's make this difficult. How about that? I don't know what that was, I just felt like doing it. Once Peter gets into the black suit, things don't exactly focus up, but for some reason it does get a bit fun. Like, you get used to the way the movie is, and it's not completely terrible that the movie is an utter disaster and unfocused, but some scenes have some really awesome quotes. Um, one in particular I really enjoyed was the exchange between Edward Brock. Well, we'll get to him later. <laughs> but Eddie screwed over Peter, and Peter runs him into a picture. When Eddie asks for forgiveness, Peter says, You want forgiveness? Get religion. It's quotes like that that make me feel like there is a good movie in here somewhere. Some fight scenes, I'd like to say, were really fun. Like, for instance, the scene between Peter and Harry. Say what you will, I actually kind of had a hell of a time with that. I know that it was green screen. I know that it was terrible. I know that there are moments like, you just know that this is a fight scene that should have been later and not so early in the film, but I had so much fun with it. I, I really liked it. And then, oh my god, let's let's not forget the birth of Sandman. Uh, I, Jesus, I love that sequence. In fact, it's beautifully shot. There's given a moment to this, you know, this lazily written moment for Sandman to turn into Sandman, and then suddenly they're like, oh, let's get a little passionate here. I loved it. I mean, I loved that so much. It's like, it was almost like an apology for saying, sorry, we wanted to really get Sandman into the works here, but here, we're going to give you some really awesomely edited CGI, no talking, just a moment. And it was beautiful. But there is so, so many stunted moments, awful dialogue. 
that convey little to nothing of themselves, like every scene was erased from the last one. No one really talks to one another. There is like some scenes, I could, I could go through so many scenes at the top of my head, like, you know, exchange between Mary Jane and Peter. There's this one scene at the, at the dinner proposal moment that is supposed to happen and never does. Next scene over, something more happened, and it's like that last scene never existed. I just feel like things could have been written better. And they don't really give anyone that crucial bit of information because it's so bogged down by its own plot. I've pretty much already stated a lot of the characters. I know that I've told you how quick everything happens within the moment, but the character arcs are truly all over the place. I could go on for days about the one-liners, the oddball casting, and oh, oh god. Gwen Stacy, why? Why were you in this film? If there was one character that I believe that wasn't miscasted but had no part to play, it's poor Bryce Dallas Howard. Oh my god, she literally shows up and does various things with practically no identity as to what she's supposed to be in the film, let alone for Peter Parker! Don't get me started on Edward Brock Jr. He even wants to tell his name 15 times in full capacity and letting us know that he's a junior and not a fucking beast. Uh, I guess we're going to have to talk about him because he's Venom, or, or lack thereof of mentioning his name or any true potential as a character. And the third act is just messy. It's messy. The dramatic moments feel forced, the action is handled well, but, you know, it's the fact that so much is happening at once, it just pulls you out of the film from one moment to another. Like, people are commenting on the third act as it's this big showdown, and like, there's this reporter? Oh my god. She, woo! She was distracting as shit. I don't like it. I don't, don't, don't like it. I don't. The crying. The crying. The crying. Oh, I'm... I never hated Spider-Man 3. I never did. But there was such a dis departure from the second. Nothing in the movie adds up. Nothing works in its true nature of Sam Raimi or Toby, to be honest. It was like there was so much to do and so much putting it off till later, and then when it was time for the, to get those moments together, they realized there was no segue, and they just went, screw it! It'll work! I didn't like Spider-Man 3, but I didn't hate it. So I would give Spider-Man 3 my weird, odd rating of calling it all right. I own it, but it's just not worth watching all the time. You kind of wonder what they were thinking when they were putting all this into one film. But let's face it, this was the first time. This wasn't the last time they did that. <coughs> well, guys, that wraps up my ultimate review for the Spider-Man films. The week after next, I will be reviewing The Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2 with Andrew Garfield, and I will get to Spider-Man Homecoming, which comes out July 7th. Like this video if you enjoyed it, and if you want me to continue with reviews like this, share, subscribe. I'm always thankful to anyone who watches, and check out my other reviews like House of Cards, my Marvel Cinematic Universe reviews, and my self-made skits that pertain to no movies whatsoever. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, until next time.